Hello, my name is George Harris, Curator and Artistic Director at Two Rivers Gallery. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this artist talk with Jessica Thompson. Our talk will begin shortly, but I wish to acknowledge first that we are streaming from the traditional unceded territory of the Clayton Tanay. Jessica Thompson is one of seven artists whose work is included in our current exhibition, The Politics of Sound, an exhibition curated by Lethbridge-based curator Tyler Stewart. The exhibition closes this Sunday, so please take some time to visit or revisit if you can. Jessica Thompson is represented in the exhibition by The Walking Machine, a wearable sound device that visitors are able to borrow. Jessica is in Ontario, hence the earlier than normal start time for us. Uh, of course, for Jessica, it's quite late. So Jessica, thank you very much for staying up with us. Um, before we begin, a couple of quick notes. This evening's talk is being captioned by Alice with the Ireland Deaf and Hard of Hearing uh, Centre. Thank you, Alice. Uh, also, at the end of the talk, there will, will be some time for questions. If you have questions, please type them into the Facebook live chat stream. And Kate, who is also online with us, will read them out for us. Jessica Thompson is a media artist working in sound, performance, and mobile technologies. Her practice investigates the way that sound reveals spatial and social conditions within cities and how the creative use of urban data can generate new modes of citizen engagement. Her artworks have shown in exhibitions and festivals internationally, and they have been included in publications such as Canadian Art, C Magazine, the Leonardo Music Journal, and the Journal of Sonic Studies. Jessica has received numerous grants, including an Ontario Government Early Researcher Award in 2019 for a research creation project that uses sound, data, and algorithms to create new understandings of place. On top of all of that, Jessica is Associate Professor in Hybrid Media, excuse me, Hybrid Media at the University of Waterloo. Jessica, we are so pleased that you are joining us this evening. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, George, and a huge thank you to the Two Rivers Gallery for uh, hosting this wonderful exhibition, and then also to uh, the great Tyler Stewart for uh, curating such an ambitious uh, exhibition of sound art. Um, so, uh, I do apologize for abandoning ship for a minute during my introduction. Uh, today, I have two cats, and uh, while they were bribed earlier in the evening, um, it appears that one is, well, the choice is to have a cat in the room or to uh, have a cat scratching and crying to get into the room, so hopefully everything kind of stays in hand. <laughs> cat issues. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly share my screen. And I'm going to make sure that we have this. And okay, so I think that looks okay from my end. Uh, George, would you mind just giving me a shout, and letting me know that it's okay from your end as well? Yeah, this looks good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so um, again, thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Jessica Thompson, and I'm a media artist, associate professor at the University of Waterloo. And in my practice, I create mobile and wearable sound pieces that are designed to be used in public space. Mm -hmm. uh, this talk is going to be in two parts. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the walking machine initially. And uh, then I'm actually going to have most of my talk around what I'm currently doing, which is more of a research and critical geography oriented practice that still has to do with sound that I thought would fit in uh, nicely with the theme of the exhibition. So I hope you don't mind uh, me uh, sort of running through the earlier work and then talking more about what I'm what I'm doing now. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge that my work was produced on the traditional territory of the Adewandron, otherwise known as Neutral, the Ashenabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, which you can see in this map here. Um, and this is the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. While, and, and if you look in detail, if you can sort of see my mouse skating around. So here is the Haldeman Tract. University of Waterloo is up here, 
And then this is the Six Nations today. Um, while my ancestors came to Canada to escape oppression, I acknowledge our participation in colonialism and my own responsibility towards reconciliation. So right now, this work involves serving as an advisor for Waterloo's first ever cluster hire of Black and Indigenous faculty, coaching and mentoring faculty, students, and staff, and continuing to pressure my mainly white institution to put its good intentions into policy. The second acknowledgement I want to make is to my research assistants. One of the great privileges and pleasures that I have in my position is that I'm able to apply for funds in order to create jobs for students. And I am so fortunate to be able to work with this talented crew. Many of my RAs have worked with me for several years because A, my projects have a tendency to, let's say, expand into new areas. And B, we have a running joke that you can never leave the project. Finally, I wanted to mention a few things around accessibility. So first of all, if you are the type of person who prefers to read along to something that you hear, my speaking notes are available by visiting the link at the top of each slide. So if you look up there, I've made you a tiny URL for today. And if you go to that note, you'll actually literally see the notes that I am reading right now. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, about what we're currently up to and you'd like some resources. There's a bibliography at the end of the notes that also links to our team resources, which is a notion. Uh, notion is a project management software and uh, this bibliography and project resources page is live. And uh, as we find things that are interesting to us or useful or help us solve a technical problem, we have we put things in there. We include citations um, in case we need to use it in papers or in grants. And uh, that's available for you to use as you will. So if you're a student, if you're a researcher, if you're an artist, um, if you're an activist and you just want to go through some links um, and copy them into your own computer, uh, feel free to do that. Um, please feel free to contact me uh, if you have questions about my other work. And if you're on Twitter, uh, feel free to follow us at Borderlines Lab, where to quote one of my students, it is Hoffin. Okay. This talk is about cities, but really it's about people. It's about how people in cities understand sound versus how we understand noise. It is about how the commodification of silence can contribute to uneven geographies. It's about how dominant ideologies amplify some voices while silencing others. And it's about how sonic data can enrich our understanding of cities by illuminating urban borderlines, invisible boundaries that affect social and economic mobility. My approach to this work is informed by my position as a biracial person who identifies as Black. This picture is actually a family photo. My grandparents attended the second racially integrated one-room schoolhouse in North America, which was started by a group that included my great uncle, William Thompson, who you can see at the top center. And then uh, beside him is my grandfather. And you can also see my great uncle, my great aunts. Um, and in the middle, squinting the sun is, is my grandma. In the 1960s, my grandmother's sister Lorraine, um, who was probably one of the youngest kids in this photo, uh, co-founded the Diversified Development and Property Management Company in Chicago, which provided low-income housing development services to poor and Black communities during the Civil Rights era. Her husband, Wilfred Olby, was a political cartoonist for the Chicago Daily Defender. And uh, I was fortunate enough, um, when he was alive, he showed me his clippings, his collection of clippings. The drawings are, are in an archive somewhere. Um, and uh, then after he passed away, uh, he, I was handed um, some of his drawings. So uh, this is one of them. And I went through and actually was able to find the, the, where it landed in the, in the uh, paper. Um, this one I could not find, uh, but it was one of my favorites. Um, I couldn't find when it was actually uh, published. I'd imagine around the same time, about 63 or 64. You can't understand cities without understanding black and brown geographies. 
And while the spatial legacies of racism are easier to see in the US because they literally mapped it, Canadian cities have also been shaped by forces such as overcrowding, redistricting, uh, neglect, slum removal, and expropriation, which is when your city buys your home by making you an offer you can't refuse. In the US, this is called eminent domain. This happened to my grandparents in 1968. No, sorry, uh, 1968 when their home at 7 Napier Street was sold and then demolished as part of the city, city of Toronto's urban renewal program. And there's just a typo there uh, ahead of 39 Midhome Drive from 1970 to 2011. Uh, they then built the Don Mount Court housing complex, uh, which if any of you are in Toronto, you'll probably be familiar with. Um, it was a housing complex which had lots of hopes. Um, it quickly fell into disrepair and ultimately failed and it was later demolished and redesigned into uh, mixed income housing. They then moved to Scarborough. Um, this is my, my great grandmother uh, in front of the house and they stayed there till the end of their lives. Um, another thing that I have is my, my grandfather's collection of slides. And so um, I remember when I first went through them, I couldn't figure out why there were so many pictures of the, of the house. Uh, there's a house in the winter, there's a house in the summer, there's the backyard of the house. Um, so just, it was, it was a recurrent theme um, in almost every role there was, a uh, carousel, there was a picture of the house. So um, I understand more now about why they were so excited by that house. Um, in the area where Monroe Street stood. Um, it, parts of Monroe exist in bits, but ultimately the site was demolished. The uh, dominant court was built, then they built um, sort of a mixed use neighborhood and homes in that area now go for between one and $2 million. So as I mentioned earlier, my talk today is organized in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about my early work, which uses sound, performance, and mobile technologies to create new forms of social interaction in public spaces. And then I'll shift my uh, towards talking about my current research, which will hopefully contribute to larger themes in the exhibition, which is how cities reveal themselves through sound, how structural interpretations of sound are closely aligned with dominant ideologies, and how intersectional listening, critical map making, and creative technologies can help to improve our understanding of inequality in cities. I'll then discuss my current project, Borderline. Please excuse the scratching, uh, which is a mobile tool that uses sound to identify and annotate the invisible boundaries that affect social and economic mobility in public space. Yes. Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, walking machine. So, walking machine is a wearable sound piece uh, that enables users to move through the city hearing the amplified sound of their footsteps in real time. And thank you so much to Kate and, and George for sending me the video of people enjoying the work. It was really wonderful to see. Um, each machine consists of microphones modified to clip to low cut shoes, a handheld amplifier, and then a set of headphones. By broadcasting the sound of his or her own motion and gesture, the wearer becomes controller, performer, and audience. Participants are able to drift through cities with a heightened tactile awareness, stopping on sewer grates, gliding through grass, splashing in puddles, and jumping on garbage cans. The effect is, is kind of like a private game in public space, where the act of walking becomes embodied listening, gestural interaction becomes a means of articulating presence, and playful interaction is both legitimized and liberated through technology. I thought it might be fun to actually uh, pull some video or to grab one of my videos that actually uh, was shot at the same time as that uh, image. And so for those of you who have not been to the gallery, um, the preceding image is actually um, almost a wall sized mural. It looks really awesome. And then there's walking machines for all of you to borrow. Um, so I figured I would actually just show this video. It's about three minutes. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. It it's covers uh, three different situations with the walking machine.
So I should also say this is the documentation of many, many hairdos. It's almost like a harpsichord or something. You'll have this video. cool that like, you can you never really notice all the different textures that are on the ground until you put on something like this you know what I mean yeah no and even the different textures have their own sounds to pad uh, depending on what kind of you know pattern you have or if you're dragging your feet it's kind of it's kind of musical it's nice to like find music in your footsteps yeah uh, this is sound like uh, Soundbike is uh, a mobile sound piece that generates and broadcasts laughter as it's pedaled through open environments. The laughter begins when the bike reaches a cruising speed and then it responds to velocity. So uh, the rider creates, the faster you go, the more it laughs. The rider basically can compose this giggles, these giggles, uh, laughter, and then hysterical laughter with their body. Uh, when the piece is engaged, the rider creates this sort of roving broadcast, and uh, because the laughter is human, uh, it forms uh, a nice sort of counterpoint to the urban soundscape. Uh, the speaker at the back works as a big signifier, and uh, it's in a bright yellow case, which distinguishes you from other riders and draws attention from curious cyclists, motorists, and passersby. Um, this piece took a long time to make. Um, I am a mainly self-taught uh, coder and, and physical computing person. So um, initially, I, the first time I, I made this it was a few years earlier. And what I did was I just attached like a bike computer, which you can use to sort of generate enough, just enough power to kind of get a headlight to go. And I actually plugged it into a tape player and uh, made sound with my bike and it was magic. I, I wanted to, though, to give the uh, user a hand in how uh, they were experiencing the work and to give them a chance to control their own sound. So I thought, you know, if we can have a sound that's chopped up into different um, elements, into different bits, that can then be recomposed, that would actually really do it. And so uh, 
I decided on laughter because it is personal, it's universal, and it's easier to remix, and it's just kind of funny. This is Freestyle Sound Kit, um, which was done a year later, and it is a piece that lets you generate and broadcast the sound of um, bass beats as you walk through the city. And then this is Swinging Suitcase. Uh, Swinging Suitcase uh, generates and broadcasts the sound of a flock of small birds that respond to movement. Uh, the vocalization, it works very similar to the sound bike. So vocalizations are constructed uh, from source clips from house sparrows, which are a very urban bird. And then they're arranged in responses um, that range from like, you know, single chirps to social chatter to scolding. When the piece is swung, the birds begin to make noise, uh, which calibrates to reflect the rate of swinging. So they, they kind of react to being swung. And then uh, what happens if you repeat a gesture for uh, too long, the birds will actually become bored and then the piece resets. Um, when you are moving something around that makes sound, if you have a change in sound, you automatically change the gesture. Um, so um, as you were trying to figure out how to play these birds, these birds in a way are playing you. Let's talk about noise in public space. So in the book Noise, uh, Jacques Attali historicizes economic development through sound and he argues that noise serves as a precursor to social and economic change. Our cities are full of sonic boundaries designed to insulate inhabitants from the more immediate effects of this onslaught. So highways are separated from residential areas with concrete barricades designed to absorb and deflect the hum of car engines. Construction is limited to specific hours and high-end condos are built with noise reducing glass to muffle the sounds of the city. Tree canopies diffuse environmental sound and increase property values. Residential areas are tightly governed by zoning regulations and any changes to density must be vetted through public consultations, which can privilege some by while excluding others. In the broad sense, noise is defined as unwanted or unwelcome sound, and this has particular impact when it occurs close to home. While many people enjoy living and working where the action is, most of us prefer to reside in spaces that are quiet, especially when we're trying to sleep. Um, How Loud by Brandon Farrell was an online mapping application that used vehicle traffic, air traffic, and then proximity to local sources like restaurants and schools to generate sound scores of different cities. Similar to a walk score, which measures access to amenities on foot, sound scores represent the average amount of amplitude that will be experienced in different areas. This project began in 2014 during a search for an apartment after Farrell realized that while other real estate metrics like demographics and crime statistics were available, and this is uh, in, in LA, uh, comprehensive data on environmental sound was not. These images are actually from his uh, original Kickstarter campaign. So you can see there was a map layer and then you could actually see your address and get a little sound score and it gave you a breakdown of what was making the noise. While the project quickly commercialized and is now mainly marketed to real estate professionals to assist them with determining slash inflating home prices, home rental prices, this information is also available to the general public who can enter their address and then generate their score. In 2020, the real estate engine Realtor.com and also Realtor.ca released a noise indicator feature, which can, I'm quoting here, Delineate noise levels down to the individual property level, linking quiet to commerce. How we perceive, understand, and interpret sound is closely aligned with systems of power. And these systems are particularly evident in how we define, interpret, and respond to noise. We use the word noise to describe the sounds of the other. And the frequency, tone, and tenor of noise complaints can serve as a powerful indicator of agency, entitlement, and aggression. In the sonic color line, Jennifer Stover describes a phenomenon that she calls the listening ear, which is an ideological filter shaped by the unspoken power of racialized listening. She says that the sonic, sonic color line describes the process of racializing sound, how and why certain bodies are expected to produce 
desire and live amongst particular sounds. And its product, the hierarchical division between whiteness and blackness. The listening ear drives the sonic color line. And it's a figure for how dominant listening practices accrue and change over time, as well as a descriptor for how the dominant culture exerts pressure on individual listening practices to conform to the sonic color lines and norms. The listening ear not only defines what is sound and what is noise, but it can also provide a convenient weapon for covertly controlling others under the guise of upholding the public good. We use noise complaints to control and police the sounds that are noise to us, and we're unlikely to complain about those we know. For example, in 2015, data analyst Ben Wellington produced a series of maps and charts of New York City noise complaints, which he wrote about in The New Yorker. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he found that over one third of the over 140,000 noise complaints were categorized as loud music or parties, and most were reported between the hours of 11 p.m. and midnight. That checks. When I saw the article, I decided to start recreating Wellington's maps using point data. So one of the issues with area data, which uh, basically takes a value and then colors the entire neighborhood or district, et cetera, with, with that value is that they overgeneralize data. So when you're mapping, it's really important to use the smallest available divisions. So if you only have um, area data, so if you have, um, if the smallest unit of information you have is a neighborhood or maybe um, a census, census block, which um, there's usually a few census blocks in each neighborhood. Um, it's really important to um, try to find the smallest bits to be able to describe that information. Um, also, it's useful if you're doing a map like this, I'm just being a bit of a nerd at the moment, um, you can also use a chart to really add dimension to the data. So um, what I was able to do was I was able to um, download from New York City's massive, massive 311 open data set, uh, point data. So uh, the reason why I was able to use this point data, which pinpoints things in latitude and longitude, is that unlike Canada, where privacy regulations prevent us from showing exact locations of things like noise complaints, in New York State, it's all out there. I guess um, I'm assuming that makes sense in cities like New York, where you, you just generally have buildings that are more than one story. So it's one thing to have a dot on a map saying that there was a noise complaint somewhere in this apartment building. It's another if it points to an individual house. Okay. So um, as I map the noise complaint using this data set, um, I noticed that most of the complaints about loud music or parties were happening either like the Lower East Side um, and uh, around Harlem and a bit north. And then this is, this is downtown Brooklyn. So um, over my career, I spent quite a bit of time in New York and I was familiar enough with the neighborhoods. So I assume based on my experience that the complaints in the Lower East Side down here were probably from bars, clubs, and restaurants. It's a cool district, lots of bars, lots of clubs, lots of restaurants. And I knew from uh, visiting them that historically Black and Latino neighborhoods like Harlem, Washington Heights, which is up here, Flatbush and bed which is down here, were rapidly, rapidly gentrifying. So last year, I decided to come back to these maps using uh, data from 2019, aka our last normal year. And the first thing I did was I mapped um, which parts of the city were zoned as residential and which were commercial. So because the Lower East Side is almost all commercial, so you can see these little um, outlines that actually show the residential areas in New York. And so the Lower East Side is almost all commercial. So that checked, um, I assumed that it's probably uh, from bars and clubs. So um, what I was able to do is, is, what we were able to do is using shapefiles um, of residential areas, um, my RA Anugra Shah was able to actually take all of these dots and uh, merge them and do a hotspot analysis with uh, the residential areas. And he was able to uh, 
basically put these sound complaint, noise complaints into sharp focus. So all of a sudden, um, I realized that, that I was right, um, that they were in and around sort of Harlem, north of Harlem, and then in downtown Brooklyn. So uh, this only tells part of the story. These are noise complaints that happened in 2019. That's all we know. Um, we know noise complaints 2019 residential areas, which makes sense given that, um, as Ben Wellington pointed out, you know, most noise complaints are at night. And also, again, we, we get more bothered by noise when it's happening close to home. So uh, I started to put the, uh, these clusters that Nigra made in dialogue with the racial makeup of the surrounding neighborhoods. Median household income. And then housing stability. While the city of New York doesn't collect demographic information for noise complaints, if we go back to their previous census, we can actually see how uh, these areas have changed over time. So this is dominant racial group by a census track and uh, the green areas are mainly Latino um, and then uh, the blue areas are mainly African American. So 2014, 2019, mean household income, uh, more yellow, uh, more money. Just 2014, 2019. Renters paying more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, if you're paying more than 30% of your income on housing, then technically you're hovering around poverty line. There it is in 2014. There it is in 2019. But even though data has been put in dialogue with other data. So even though we have this data about noise complaints around alongside uh, data about people, these maps still, still present an incomplete picture. And I think it's important to remember that maps are incomplete representations. For example, this stripe here around uh, Jackie Robinson Park in Harlem happens to be down the street from where a friend of mine lives. So when I asked her about it, she explained that this part of the park has a really wide sidewalk and that when the weather's warm, people hold barbecues on the street. Um, so in black culture, a barbecue is an event. Um, they're social. The apartments in the media area are older, and she said that most use window mounted air conditioners um, that don't really work that well. It makes sense not to cook in your already stifling apartment and sidewalk barbecues are a normal part of this neighborhood. Broadcasting sound into space is a form of sonic agency, and unless we have a point to prove, we tend not to do it in spaces that are unfamiliar to us. As I said earlier, if you call the police about a noise complaint, you're asking them to act on your behalf. And this is more likely to happen if you're confident that the police are there to serve and protect you. In other words, it's easier for whiter, wealthier people to complain about their poor black and brown neighbors than it is for those neighbors to complain about them. In order to understand the sonic composition of the city, we need to engage in an intersectional approach to listening and a feminist approach to data. Alison Martin defines intersectional listening as an intentionally speculative mode of listening that approaches the sonic from multiple axes with the intention of amplifying a multitude of Black experience surrounding gentrification. Intersectional listening refutes an analysis that hears only race, only class, only gender, or any other facet of identity. Instead, intersectional listening asks us to hear multiple categories of identity concurrently. Intersectional listening considers the systems of power that govern our sonic environment, and that sound itself emanates through spatial, social, and economic forms of privilege. Data feminism asks us to challenge unequal power structures by illuminating systems of oppression and calling attention to the types of data that are not present.
let's talk about Borderline. Um, so Borderline is a research creation project of mine. Um, I say research creation because I'm a professor and this is how artists actually get funding from uh, the, the tri-agency funding councils, our national councils. Um, they, they don't have a category for art and so um, you, you kind of get shoved into humanities and so research creation refers to uh, the type of creative practice that addresses uh, humanities type questions. It's a very strange term. It is a Canadian invention as well. So if you are watching this from the US um, or, or beyond and you're thinking I've never heard of this, um, it's because it's, it's a Canadian invention. Um, so uh, this project uses sound to create new understandings of place by identifying and annotating invisible boundaries that affect social and economic mobility in cities. And I call these invisible boundaries borderlines. Um, using algorithms trained to identify uh, about 100 different common sounds, the project enables users to automatically tag sounds in their environment using their mobile phones and then export the data in an open, accessible format. So what you do is you actually tap the button, um, it records a five second sample. Um, technically, uh, the neural networks, uh, the algorithms in uh, this project can actually identify sounds in about two seconds, but we do five so that we can actually do a little bit of sound mixing. I say we um, in that uh, the algorithms uh, that identify these sounds were developed by the great Jeremy Pinto, one of my other um, research assistants. This is Lily. She's gone down. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so basically what happens is after you um, identify the sound, um, it gives you an indication of what the neural nets think they hear. They make a whole lot of mistakes. You can actually correct them and you can also add notes. And the nice thing about it is when you tap them and if you happen to be in the same location where you recorded it, it will start playing back. As you walk away, the sound will fade out. So um, if I can say a quick story, um, when I was testing out uh, this fading out function, which was actually really hard to, to get into place, um, I wanted the sound to decay the same way that other sounds did. So um, at the amplitude that's coming out of your phone, um, it, it sound kind of fully decays after about uh, 200 meters. So, uh, as you go away, the softer it gets, but it, it's actually hard to make happen. And uh, the great Nahal Connectar, who is uh, one of my other research assistants, this killed him. It took him weeks. So what we were doing was um, there was a presentation coming up um, and I was uh, at my studio here in Hamilton, which is in the north part of the city in sort of an industrial area. And I was recording um, sort of a air conditioning type thing on the side of my studio building. And I uh, put it on Bluetooth in my car and then I started driving away because I wanted to make sure that the sound faded out smoothly and that at a certain point it was gone. So that was fine. So I proceeded to drive home. And then as I turned onto my street, um, I got about halfway down and suddenly I could start to hear purring and I realized it was uh, my cat purring. And uh, of course I had had to see if it could identify cats, it can. <laughs> and, uh, and basically I was greeted by these, these purring sounds coming out of, my, out of my speakers of my car. It was pretty fun. Um, these are the neural nets themselves. Um, the, the recordings which trained these algorithms uh, are available through the Freesound Annotator. Freesound.org is a nonprofit organization where uh, people contribute recordings of sounds, a lot of field recordings, that sort of thing. And uh, what they do is uh, groups of volunteers will actually listen to the sound clips and then uh, proceed to actually tag them. So it's, uh, it's a really neat way of identifying sounds. Um, other um, sort of mechanisms like uh, Google's audio set, for example, will like sort of take snips of sound from YouTube videos, which means you have this kind of crummy sound coming in. And then also um, the sound that you're, you're pulling from the sound sample you're using could be um, a tiny bit of a video. So it just causes a lot of problems. And so it's much better to use actual recordings. Um, so this 
project is organized into, into two objectives. Um, the first thing is, is what are the relationships between sound and urban environment, sounds in the urban environment and indicators like demogra demographics, housing patterns, gentrifications, and displacement. So what's the relationship between urban sound and social change in cities? And the secondly, how might we, how might mobile technologies be used to create more inclusive methods of capturing, annotating, and mapping sound in cities? Borderline emerged out of my frustration with the limitations of sound maps. While soundscape studies has been recognized discipline since the early 70s, the systems developed to notate sound spatially have historically been really limited in scope. Um, in the same way that maps are incomplete abstractions, uh, sound maps are subject to necessary selections of what you notice, what you remember, or what you happen to pick up with a megaphone. The project evolved uh, from a series of sound walks through gentrifying neighborhoods that I began to lead in 2014. For those not familiar, a sound walk is any excursion whose main purpose is uh, listening to the environment. As we walked through cities, I realized that the same issues that were frustrating me about sound maps were also surfacing in sound walks, and that these issues were confounded by the fact that they were being done by members of an art community, which I am one person, of which I'm one too, and who, because of various forms of privilege, were comfortable walking almost anywhere. Um, this is a, an aside. Um, this is in Newcastle uh, in the UK. And uh, Newcastle is a city in the northern part of, of the UK. And this wall here was uh, the original wall that separated England and Scotland. So it seemed like an appropriate place to kind of talk about gentrification, borders, and borderlines. So um, out of this frustration, um, and because you know our communities do have this wonderful privilege of being able to swim in all sorts of areas, um, I began to become curious about how sound walking might be used as a lens for critically engaging with urban data from the ground up. And I began to lead sound walks that follow trajectories of urban data sets. So, this project uses methods that draw from like sound studies, critical map making, and artistic intervention. Um, the project is meant to create new forms of citizen engagement by listening through and centering the ears on the ground. So unlike uh, projects that maybe have um, you know, microphones pu uh, put in public space where you're, you're sort of recording for a while and trying to figure out the noise levels, um, cities often do this when they're trying to figure out revisions to noise ordinances. This actually um, takes sound and uh, it takes the personal ex subjective experience of sound uh, that you can then tag. And because you can open it in, because you can export it into an openly available format, you can actually create sound maps and then interface them with other forms of data, um, use them for advocacy, um, use them for creative purposes, uh, whatever, whatever you'd like. So um, our work, um, that we do is guided by our core principles, which includes taking an intersectional approach to understanding data. So uh, when we map, we map uh, uh, sonic data in dialogue with other data always, right? Um, we practice transparency in our data collection uh, and in our mapping and metadata that's in line with principles of feminist data. Um, we prioritize accessibility in our design decisions and the language we use to describe this work. And we create a supportive working and learning environment for students. As you may have noticed earlier, um, with the exception of the great Kira, McMa Kira McMaster, I have an all BIPOC crew. And mapping things like inequality and, um, and um, just instability and difference in access can be kind of depressing. Um, our running joke is that we call them our angry maps. And often when we're mapping, um, all of us just kind of, on one hand, you're excited because you found something interesting to map. But on the other hand, it's really, really frustrating because you'll see things like, you know, in downtown Toronto uh, or in, in neighborhoods in the downtown core, there's lots of access to various sources of um, financial services like banks and credit unions, all that sort of stuff. And then you get out further 
and it's harder to get to a bank, but then you see um, payday lenders. Um, it's weird making a map of Hamilton and realizing that, you know, there's concentrations of, of food banks only in the downtown core, but not further out into the suburbs, right? So it can be, um, it can be frustrating and sometimes traumatizing when you're mapping things um, to see that, you know, the inequality which you always suspected was there is showing up in the data. So um, right now we're doing a project with an organization called Critical Mass in Port Hope, Ontario. Actually, fun fact, uh, Tyler Stewart, who curated the politics of sound, is also doing a piece uh, for Critical Mass in Port Hope. So uh, we're going to be able to uh, show this work alongside Tyler's work from his own practice, which is really exciting. So the project involves producing a series of maps, um, guided walks, and then community dialogues to examine how the town has changed since the pandemic and how they might work together to make uh, their future town more equitable and inclusive. So I wanted to show you the back end of one of our prelim preliminary maps to explain how we connect data research, critical map making and sound. So here's what we do. We use open data. Um, using open data, we map and identify borderlines in different cities to identify uneven geographies. So what we did here was we mapped the percentage of people who own their homes. These are the percentage of people who rent their homes. Um, and then we put them into, into dialogue. In the areas where we have great contrast, so if you take a look here, you can see that right here you have a high concentration of owners with a really high concentration of renters, right? Um, so uh, that forms a borderline and we will draw one. Then what we do is we actually validate our borderline. So just because we see a big difference in data, we don't know what's there. So what we will do is we will um, we will get onto Google Street View and start like moving around and trying to see where the borderlines are. Um, we consult with members of the community. Um, in about a month or so, we're going to be able to provide there's no not another surge. Um, we're going to be able to go down and take a look at the borderlines. Um, and then what we do is we add maps of the borderlines to the borderline um, app so that people can actually follow along and record and tag sounds. So eventually these sounds are going to help us discover other areas of difference in the city. Um, so basically we had mapped uh, this and we, we realized from these borderlines that um, there is a difference here between uh, the owners and renters, but of course we didn't really know why. So what we did is we looked at Google Street View and we realized that um, this road here does not contain any sidewalks. Um, so, sorry, there's a better picture there of the borderline and, uh, and the street. So we realized that that street didn't contain any sidewalks. Um, and what we did was we, we talked to one of the administrators from Critical Mass, and after speaking with, uh, with Debbie Beatty, we learned that this area has a lot of seniors housing that explains uh, the rentals and maybe a little bit of the difference of income if you have people in, on uh, fixed incomes. And we also learned uh, that uh, in late 2020, a group of them took to the streets to protest. So what they did is um, there, there are very few uh, grocery stores in Port Hope. Um, in fact, they pride themselves. Um, it's, it's a very well-preserved downtown. So it's very, it's very cute. Um, it's kind of like Shit's Creek. Like it's, it's just a very cute, attractive, well-preserved historical uh, downtown. So there's not very many big box stores. In fact, they fought hard to not have big box stores. They're, they're over in Coburg, which is one town over. And so if you go down Rose Glen Road, you'll hit uh, the Giant Tiger. Um, which is down here, uh, cut off, um, and uh, that's where a lot of seniors get their groceries. So the city had agreed that, you know, this, this, uh, the street needed sidewalks, but it had been kind of caught in bureaucracy. And so what they did was they got a police escort and uh, they had a rolling protest. Uh, they walked and they scooted and used the wheelchairs to illustrate 
that every time they want to get groceries, they have to go down this two lane street with a narrow shoulder. And that is their only way of getting down there. Um, so just to, to wrap up here, um, to understand the sonic landscape, we have to develop equitable and inclusive ways of capturing, mapping, and analyzing sonic data. Uh, these methods require an approach that takes into account social and economic disparities, privilege, and power. It also requires us to make better maps, have a critical approach to data, and to use creativity to help make our world a better place. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, thank you. Um, we uh, we do have a bit of time for questions. Does uh, does anybody else? Uh, sorry, does anybody have any questions? That's very funny because I, I actually can't see you, so it's oh. it's kind of a, I can see no, I can see I can see you, George, but I can't, can't see any questions coming up on Facebook Live. No, so. no, I, it's, uh, it's that's okay. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've been keeping an eye on the chat, and I um, there have been lots of thank yous and um, mentions of how fantastic and interesting it is, which I agree with. Um, but uh, I actually have a question, if you don't mind. Um, sure. I, first of all, thank you so much um, for sharing this such fascinating work. Um, and I'm interested, I think it makes a lot of sense to study the link between um, noise or sound and um, social inequity in urban centers and cities. And I'm wondering if you have any experience doing similar research in more um, rural areas, and if you think the link exists in the same way, or um, or if it manifests itself differently? Yeah, you know, that is a question I probably would have answered differently prior to the pandemic. So um, in a way we're doing it now, Port Hope is a very small city. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting to be able to be invited by Critical Mass to actually, um, you know, create some alternative walking maps for them and, and do some public convening and that sort of thing. So because we've, we've um, We've learned quite a bit actually already about how small cities have changed. Um, so I think that um, I think there's divisions in everywhere. I think that how pronounced they are depends on um, things like things like race, things like income. Um, I think that it it very much depends that on that, and also why why does the place exist to begin with? Um, is is the place where you're living a community that was specifically built? Um, you know, maybe as an adult community, um, maybe it's a gated community. Um, is it an older neighborhood that's changed hands several times? Um, I think, um, especially in Canada, um, but in the U.S. as well, with the pandemic, we saw um, a mass exodus from cities. Um, either they didn't feel safe anymore, um, or uh, you know. Um, because I, it seems funny to talk to people in BC about this because I, you know it more than, than anyone, but you know, in Ontario, here in Ontario, housing prices are of course through the roof. Here in Hamilton, oddly enough, it is one of the, uh, they've had the, one of the largest growths in, in the past year actually uh, in the country um, because it's so close to Toronto, like you can just jump on a train and what if I minutes you're there. Um, I think that as one of the things I'm really curious about, and I'm, in a way I'm kind of concerned about, but again, I'm an academic, I'm an artist, and I'm aware that my presence is also part of the problem, right? So I think that um, as people are moving to areas, and I've seen this in Hamilton here as well, you know, housing prices are almost triple what they were. Um, the a home that would be on sale for under four hundred thousand um, dollars, even three years ago, is now uh, they, they don't get posted. They, they're going for you know a lot over asking, and so you're starting to see those same things posted at you know eight hundred thousand dollars, nine hundred thousand dollars, million. That sort of thing. Um, so I don't think, but I think that the the big challenge here is is that 
it's when you're moving to a new place, it's not like there was nothing there. There's always people. And so the idea of displacement, um, which is a big element of, of gentrification as well, is really um, urgent in smaller communities because um, if housing stock becomes unaffordable, if rental properties, if rents go up, um, if rent rental properties are hard to find, where do people go? Um, and Hamiltonians are not having it. Um, there's been a lot of debate and uh, they've been really vocal about the fact that, you know, it is a working class city. Um, it's, it has a downtown that's geographically separated from what we call the mountain. You wouldn't call it a mountain, but it's just, it's a part of the escarpment. Um, and so it's a city that's divided geographically. Um, there's limited housing stock. Um, so I'm, I'm really concerned um, as, as people start to move into cities, as population shift, I think we're going to still have the same, we're going to have same, this, some similar trends because, you know, um, you have new, new influx of people, you often see stores, services, um, art, culture, all these things. And everyone likes new things. Um, Lance Freeman wrote a really good book in, 20, in 2005 called There Goes the Hood. And he did a study of, um, I think it was a study of Harlem and a study of Bed-Stuy. And in it, uh, he was interviewing people about gentrification. And ev everyone likes nice cupcakes or a good coffee shop or a safe, well-resourced school for their kids or tree-lined streets. Um, it is when uh, those things become out of reach that people start getting very worried. And the fear of displacement, I think, is real for everyone. So um, I think what we're going to see is these sort of micro, maybe maybe, uh, maybe the uneven or even geographies won't be as pronounced, but we'll start to see them on a smaller scale. And certainly um, in Port Hope, one of the first things I was told when we were asking about, you know, how's this place changed, that sort of thing, um, apparently there is a farm. And uh, if, if, if you are interested in this, you should totally go do this. Do you? It's been a really trying couple of years. Whatever makes you feel happy, it's great. But there, there is an Angora goat farm um, that is north of that city, and you can pay two hundred dollars for a family of four to go and cuddle a big cuddle baby goats because cuddling is part of their development, and I guess they're very cuddly. So you can, you know, pay a fee. You can have lunch, uh, goat cheese tastings, and you can cuddle cute little furry babies. Um, and you know, who doesn't want to cuddle cuteness? Um, can everyone uh, pay $200 for their family to go and do that one day? Maybe not. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think that what we've done so far with uh, our methods of map making, I think they're solid and I think they can apply. So um, of course, earlier I said uh, that there's two things with my project. First, RAs can never leave the project. Everyone likes to stay and we keep on, I keep on rehiring them. Um, but also um, the project tends to expand and I'm really excited to start looking at that now that we are starting to see the census data trying to, trickling in. So a lot of the mapping data we have right now is from 2016 because it's the last census. And the 2021 data is being sort of gradually trickled out by Statistics Canada. And so I'm really excited to see how smaller communities have changed. That was a really long answer to your question, Kate. Did I cover it? It was the perfect answer. Thank you so much. It's so interesting. Thank you for such a thoughtful response. Um, and that is the only question I have um, from my end. So I don't know if George has any, but thank you so much um, for such a thoughtful talk and a very thoughtful response. I, uh, I did have a question um, uh, related uh, perhaps a little bit more to your material practice, Jessica. Um, uh, I know through work like uh, the, the walking machine uh, and uh, sorry, it, it was, was it called the laughing bicycle, the, the suitcase as oh, well? Uh, yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your, your your process of, of creating and building these artworks. Is this um, is this uh, sort of a, a, a group event, a group uh, process? Is this something that is um, uh, 
uh, entirely solo? Is this, uh, I, I know earlier on you referred to um, kind of a learning curve, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the context of mm -hmm. uh, figuring out a lot of your uh, process. But I, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about how uh, you conceive and bring into uh, existence these uh, uh, really quite remarkable uh, and uh, inventive uh, devices. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it depends on the work. So um, yeah, you know, I I uh, I finished my undergraduate degree at York University from York University in 1998, and uh, I was a double major. I majored in painting and sculpture. Um, so um, you know, BFA. So uh, technology didn't really occur to me, and uh, so. Um, when I started working in technology, I took a lot of workshops at InterAccess Artist Run Center, so um, which is a great place if you're in Toronto and want to learn something new, want to attend panels, want to see work, or if you just need cheap studio space, they have an excellent studio membership. Um, so with some pieces I was able to make myself, like Walking Machine. Walking Machine was technically finished in 1999, but it was very bulky, like I was having a problem finding amplifiers. Um, and I was trying to solder some together and they just weren't, weren't clean sounding. And so um, the reason why it's from 2003 is because um, I discovered smaller guitar amps and, and that's when I was able to like finish the piece. Um, with other projects, I needed to have help. And so I'm really grateful to the people who I have been able to work with, um, Dave Kemp, um, Dave Kemp, Rob Cruikshank, um, Gordon, like just, um, Basically, what I would do is just ask my friends who knew how to do these things if I could take them to dinner and ask them how to get started. Um, in some cases, what I would do is I would, um, because I, I always worked full time, so the work happened, you know, at the end of the workday, after you eat, after laundry gets done, all that jazz. So what I would do is just um, pay them, you know, I'd be, I'd be working and then I'd be sort of paying, paying them. Uh, I was able to get some grants from the Ontario Arts Council, which is great, but um, it, it ranges from asking how to do it and then working on my own to like, I truly do not know how to do this, <laughs> um, to, um, to um, and I also worked with Renji Batnajer, who's a fantastic sound artist out of Brooklyn. Um, so um, things like uh, the swing suitcase I made myself, it took me a long time. It, it was hard to, uh, the, to, to a tiny accelerometer, the difference between the set, how it moves around when someone's walking with a suitcase versus swinging a suitcase versus shaking a suitcase. It's really minute and it took a really long time to sort out. Um, I think that, you know, for media artists, being able to try to put together some of your work yourself is important um, because I think that it helps you to um, understand what you're asking others, but it's also totally fine to not know how to do things. No one knows how to do everything. And I think sometimes um, in technology, it can feel a little closed or exclusive or inaccessible. So I think that um, it's been really great to see uh, the democratization of technology. It's been great to see things like Arduino be invented when I first started making things. When I, when I first made the walking machine, there was uh, the iPod, it was two, like when I finished it, the iPod was invented two years later and uh, you know, GPS wasn't on phones. And I remember when Arduinos came out, I was like, oh my goodness, this would have been so much easier to make the sound back with. Um, so it, it, it kind of depends. The reason why I have uh, research assistants for um, my project now is because uh, A, there's things I don't know how to do. I don't know how to train neural networks. Uh, a lot of times things I want to do actually involve invention, even when you are a tech. Um, so even if you have that background, it can still feel like it's still figuring out how things work. Um, but also, you know, the reason why um, we receive grants as researchers and as professors is to give students jobs. Um, that is uh, my most recent um, award, which is, uh, through, which is uh, called an Early Researcher Award through the Government of Ontario, is literally 100% of it is goes to um, student salaries. 
the experience of being able to work on a research project with a professor and, and I think that this is this is relevant for my work but it's really relevant if you think about you know people who work in labs or people who work on special equipment being able to actually get a job that uh, helps you that works with where you can work with a professor and learn from them gain new skills and um, it's it's so hard for um, people coming out of school right now like it's it's a rough economy and there's there's a lot of a lot of people so i think that anything that students can do to help distinguish themselves from others is really important and um yeah i have so many ras because i just really like working with people um and also they get on like a house on fire so it, it's um it's sometimes making things with people is slower like it, it's not a thing where you have you know you have two people you work this fast you add two more it's this much faster like it, it doesn't work that way sometimes things are slower just because we have more people but um i think that i'm such a process oriented artist that um the the process is just as important as the outcome to just skip back and answer the first part of your question um when i think of interactive works um i envision them as fully uh for, fully thought out and usually it starts with a gesture and so sometimes it is, uh, you know, I wonder what it'd be like to walk the city and hear the sound of my own footsteps or I'm making sound recordings as I'm walking through the city and I don't like the sound recordings because I can always tell where they are and I just wanted to amplify my footsteps. Um, sometimes just pieces are start with a gesture. So the, the swing in the swinging suitcase was the, the spine of the work. Um, it, sometimes the, the ideas kind of come to me fully formed and then it's just trying to figure out how. And other times it's just an inkling uh, that something is important. Um, and it can feel a little vulnerable when you're starting to make new work um, and you are kind of operating without a precedent because um, you often wonder if you're, if you're crazy. Um, when I first started making work in public space in Toronto, um, I could not get my work shown for love or money because um, Toronto was, was, there was really great painting coming out of Toronto at the time. There was really great um, video art and performance coming out of Toronto at the time. However, um, in terms of, you know, work in public space um, that wasn't site specific, it was kind of site agnostic. My works are mobile. It doesn't, they don't have to be in any one space. They go between spaces. Um, it was just a harder sell. Um, I had letters of, re of uh, rejection that would say, you know, um, we only, we're only doing two person shows this year because of budget cuts. Um, there's no one who really fits with your work. There's no others who quite fit with your work. And unfortunately we can't justify having an empty gallery. So um, once uh, more people became interested in public space and civic engagement, um, I think that that uh, became much easier also um, because I had to sort of find my community, like in, in the States, for example, um, suddenly, you know, you show in the States and suddenly Canadian at the time, you know, you show in the States and suddenly Canadians pay attention. It's not really that way anymore, but, um, at the time it was certainly true. So I think that, um, I don't know, it, it, there's all sorts of things that go into making the work. Um, I'm a slow worker. Um, I showed you a selection of works, but I, I don't have a large body of work. Um, I'm not constantly turning things out. Um, a, because I'm always, you know, trying to figure, I always have ideas I don't know how to build, but also, um, again, I've, I've always worked uh, during, during doing, when I've been making my, my artwork. So um, I don't have, or no, I'm always, I'm always trying to balance schedules. Also, I just, I work slowly. That's just who I am. I embrace it now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, George, did that answer your question? Does that help? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. That was uh, that was great. Uh, great answer. Um, I, Kate, I wonder, are there any more? Are there any more questions? That's all from my end. Thank you so much. All right. Well, <clears throat> Jessica, uh, uh, hearing no more questions, I uh, I really want to uh, offer my sincere thanks to you for a, a fascinating talk. Um, I, uh, I would like to thank Alice for her closed captioning of tonight's event and Kate for her support and uh, relaying of questions. Uh, I would like to share with everybody again that this is the 
last week to uh, see the uh, current exhibition, The Politics of Sound. Uh, so please come and visit us before 5 p.m. on Sunday, April 10th. Uh, and uh, to all of you, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I, I wish you all a, a very good evening. Uh, take care, and I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.